This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Moran and the boy pulled me to safety. The boy was then sent to fetch a carriage I had waiting. Shortly, we were on our way to see a doctor under my employ who set my ribs and leg. My own headquarters had been raided, so it was best I stay in hiding until I could recover. Day after day, my hatred for Holmes increased until I could stand it no longer. I informed Moran that he must kill Holmes. But he failed. Oh, yes, he failed. Moran and I devised a plan where he might rid the world once and for all of Holmes. Good plan. I had warned Moran to be cautious that Holmes was dangerous, that he could outsmart him. Well, Moran was smart, but not smart enough. And so he forfeited his freedom, and thus the insufferable Dr. Watson had another tale to tell of Holmes' victory over me. The Adventure of the Empty House. Doesn't that man ever stop writing those obnoxious adventures? Each time he reveals how Holmes crossed my path and defeated me, the public is more aware of my presence, and I much prefer anonymity. But I must give Moran credit for one essential thing. Because of his loyalty to me, not once did he reveal to Holmes or the police that I was still alive and recovering. At least now, with my recovery, I can reorganize regroup and again build my empire of power and crime. But this time, I shall use the newest advances of science, the newest inventions to combat homes. Including the automobile? Automobile? What's that? I mean, uh, the horseless carriage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I shall also use the horseless carriage. Why do you ask? Well... Uh, you were kind enough to tell me about the haunted bagpipes. May I, in turn, tell you a story Dr. Watson told me called The Adventure of the Horseless Carriage? If you must. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now let's drop in again on Sherlock Holmes' famous colleague, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I was watching from the window as you drove up. Do my eyes deceive me or... Haven't you a brand new car? I'm glad to say I have, Dr. Watson. You want to come out for a spin? No, thank you. Some other time, perhaps. <laughs> Can't help thinking of the first time I ever accepted such an invitation. I sent a story, Dr. Watson, and judging from the reminiscent expression, one in which you and your friend, Dr. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, were both concerned. Oh, hardly, Doctor. You're <laughs> quite right, my boy. Sherlock Holmes and I took our first ride in a motor car together back in the autumn of, of 1903 when Holmes had just concluded the affair of the, the creeping man. I refuse to listen to any more hints, Dr. Watson, unless you're going to tell us the whole story. Oh, of course, Mr. Bell, as soon as you've had your word with our listeners, I'll relate the strange account which I've entered in my case book as the adventure of the horseless carriage. Men, if you want to be a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed. That's why I urge you to try Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every lock in place, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kremel never, never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look, as if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. 
K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, you have my undivided attention. How about the adventure of the horseless carriage? It all began one morning when Holmes and I were breakfasting in our rooms in Baker Street. Holmes was opening his mail. If you can tear yourself away from the kidneys and bacon for a moment, Watson, I'd like to read you a letter. It's a bad habit, Holmes, burdening your mind with problems at breakfast. It appears a suggestion, told you so a hundred times, but go ahead. My dear Mr. Holmes, my friend Mr. Alexander Holder, the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson of Threadneedle Street, informs me that you recently were of great assistance to him in a highly confidential matter. Oh, I'm therefore what? taking the liberty of calling upon you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, Tuesday, in the hope of obtaining your assistance and advice. Yours faithfully, Austin Grierson. Grierson? Austin Grierson? Seems to me I've heard or read about that name somewhere later. That's more to you. Thank you, no. Take a look at his letter and see if you can form any conclusion from it. While I have a glance at what our reference books can offer on Mr. Grierson. <clears throat> Mailed yesterday, postmark Southampton. Mr. Grierson is presumably well-to-do. The notepaper is of expensive quality. Capital, Watson. What else? Mm, nothing else, I can see. My dear Watson, nothing else that you observe, you mean. Mr. Grierson has evidently written under the stress of strong emotion. Notice how the pen nib has dug into the paper at several points. He is evidently a man who is used to having his own way. The manner in which he appoints the art which he will call upon us today indicates that. He is obviously mechanically minded and, despite his wealth, still interests himself in machinery. Oh, now, Holmes, how can you tell that? There are faint traces of two fingerprints of the writer's left hand where he held the paper with fingers that were a trifle oily. And your nostrils should enable you to identify the very faint odor of machine oil. Oh, no, not my nostrils. <laughs> the light is better over here near the window. Let's see what our reference book says. Well? Austin Grierson, Chairman, Board of Directors, Southampton Machine Works, Patent D of Grierson's Internal Combustion Engine for Motor Cars. Ah, that's where I saw his name in a newspaper account concerning a race of some of these idiotic new horseless carriages. Quite so. And furthermore, Watson, I can tell you that Mr. Grierson is fond of animals and especially a large Airedale. Oh, no, Holmes, I absolutely refuse to believe that you can deduce that from the fellow's letter. I never said I could. But it's precisely ten o'clock, and Mr. Grierson, complete with Airedale, has just been ushered in our front door by Mrs. Hudson. Amazing deduction, I must say. You saw it out of the blasted window. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Grierson. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> ah, quiet, <laughs> Jeff. Quiet there. <laughs> this is my colleague, and a very good guardian, too. Well, sit down, Mr. Grierson. And tell me why you feel the need of a watchdog. The newness of his collar and lead would indicate that you've only recently acquired him. Yeah, quite right, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'll get to the point at once. I made all my money in machinery. I don't mind saying it, I'm a pretty wealthy man. Mm. Uh, during the past three years, I've devoted all my time and most of my fortune to developing the coming wonder of the world, sir, the motor car. Wonder of the world, eh? You never replace the horse, Mr. Grierson. Never. Mm, you sound like my nephew Edward, Dr. Watson. He shares your opinion. Oh, but I assure you, sir, that if my new motor car can only win the forthcoming endurance test, of which you may have read... I shall have no difficulty in selling a car a week. Fifty-two cars a year. <laughs> Preposterous. Well, nevertheless, it is the case, Dr. Watson. In fact, Mr. Holmes, it is the very excellence of my prospects that has brought me to you. How's that, Mr. Grayson? I have just recently completed and been testing the first model of my new car. Two cylinders instead of the old-fashioned one. Tremendous power, Mr. Holmes. The endurance test is to be held tomorrow over a course from Southampton to Alton and back. A distance of over 40 miles. 40 miles? Mm, and I feel certain that my new car will win. And as you can easily imagine, gentlemen, the ensuing publicity will be invaluable. In fact, Mr. Holmes, I have no hesitation in saying that I must win. I see. At least one of the backers of the other three cars that entered in this contest feels the same way. And the last two weeks, there have been one very definite attempt to damage my new car. And yesterday, a second attempt almost resulted in my death. Mm. Evidently, some people do take these horseless carriages seriously. Yes, Dr. Watson. Unlike you and my nephew, Edward, who feels that I'm dissipating the family fortunes in a mad scheme, some people do. Only the fortunate fact that I was driving slowly at the moment saved me from death when the testing apparatus broke. It could not have been an accident, Mr. Grasson. Did the mechanism show definite signs of being tampered with? Beyond any doubt, Mr. Holmes. There were file marks on the steering yoke. 
And you are certain that these attempts are being made by outside sources, not by members of your own family or persons uh, associated with your venture? My family and fellow workers are above suspicion, Mr. Holmes. So I hope that you will undertake to guard both the car and myself during the next 24 hours until the race is over. Under one condition, Mr. Gerson. Name it, sir. I'm always anxious to experience a new sensation. My condition is that you take Dr. Watson and myself for a drive in your racer as soon as we can get to Southampton. What? Done, Mr. Holmes. Not I. You'll never get me to risk my life in one of those wretched things. if you have to slow down almost to a standstill every time you see a horse. <laughs> Don't worry, Doctor. The horses get used to it. Not if they show horse sense. <laughs> if you like that, Holmes. Appalling, my dear Watson. Gentlemen, here we are, safely home again. Most interesting experience, Mr. Grayson. Oh, phew. I feel better when I've washed off some of this dust. I got to the house in a moment, Dr. Watson. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry there's no place to wash up down here in the barn. I've been keeping the car here for the past couple of weeks instead of down at the machine works. At least this old barn is near the house. I wonder where that fellow Simmons can be. Just a moment, gentlemen. I'll hang up your dusters in this cupboard. Here, yeah, now, yeah, now, get away from that car, you two. If you don't, your skulls will be bashed in with this uh, Just a moment, my good man. There's no need for you to be a friend. I, I know who you are. You're someone of those uh, sneaky on, people. Simmons, be... hold on. These gentlemen are friends of mine. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh. Uh, this is Joe Simmons, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, Simmons. Joe Simmons. The foreman of my machine works and the best motor car mechanic in the world. You'll understand my suspicions, Mr. Grierson, when I tell you that Mrs. Charles saw some bloke hanging about here while you were up in London. What, well, did you catch him? No, I'm sorry to say I didn't say it. We chased him, but the flight got away. Hello, Uncle Austin. How did she run? Perfectly, Charles, perfectly. You and Joe have a tune to her hair. Uh, a gentleman, my nephew Charles Grierson, who helped me design my car. Charles, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? She's a beauty, isn't she, gentlemen? Come, uh, let's go up to the house for some tea. Uh, Simmons, you will be here on guard tonight? You bet I will, Mr. Grierson. And uh, keep Jeff with you. Uh, stay here, Jeff. Oh, oh, dog. Oh. It was rotten luck, that fellow getting away, Uncle. I was gaining on him till I climbed the fence near the road, and then I gave my ankle a twist that ended all hope of catching him. Oh, too bad, Charles. Tell me, Mr. Grierson, have you or your nephew any suspicions that might indicate uh, which one of your competitors is behind these attempts? No, not a thing. I wish we had, Mr. Holmes. Have you taken any precautions? We've rigged an alarm bell from the barn to the house. Simmons has only to touch a lever, and the gong will ring in the main hall. What of Simmons himself? There's such a thing as bribery, you know. I'd stake my life on Joe's honesty. He's been with me 20 years. Ah, now that I've washed the dust off the outside, I'm glad to see that you gentlemen have something that'll do the job internally. <laughs> yes, yeah, you are, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Hello, Uncle Austin. Good evening. Oh, Helen, my dear. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. My ward, Miss Helen Lacey, and her fiancé, my other nephew, Edward Gress. How do you do? I'm glad to see you gentlemen survived your ride in my uncle's infernal contrivance. Yes, to my surprise, we did. I gather that you agree with my low opinion of the hostess carriage. I've told my uncle often enough that I regard it in the same light as the South Sea bubble. <laughs> now, Edward, don't get started on that again. <laughs> Just you wait until we've won the race and are turning out cars by the dozen, Edward, and you'll find yourself with plenty of legal work on your hands. <laughs> Taking care of damage suits, probably. By the way, I ran across a rather odd thing today in a letter of inquiry from America. Did you know that in all countries except England, people drive on the wrong side of the road? What? Do you mean to say that in other countries they don't keep to the left? Absolutely not. They drive on the right. <laughs> Barbaric. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson are going to be staying with us, Helen, until... The alarm. Uh, holy Scott! Simmons! The car! Oh, oh, something's happened! Hurry! <laughs> Simmons! 
Let us in. Are you all right? I'm all right. Why did you ring the alarm? Well, look at that, Mr. Holmes. Jeff! Why, it's the dog. He's dead. Of all the rotten things. And from the rigor of the limbs, I have no doubt he was poisoned. Uh, no question of it, Holmes. Well, the scoundrel must have been frightened off by the alarm bell before he could tackle Simmons. What do you think, Mr. Holmes? I think, Mr. Grierson, that Dr. Watson and I will stand guard over the car until race time tomorrow. I wouldn't like to see Jeff's fate visited upon a human being. Mr. Grayson. Oh, you've done your job, Mr. Holmes. Now I'll do mine. Careful of that curve here, Petersfield, Uncle. Be careful, Uncle. Uh, good luck. Come back all in one piece. Car number four. Go. I tell you, sir. What's the time, Helen? One hour and 46 minutes. With luck, the first car should be finishing soon, shouldn't it? You're overlooking the time necessary for changing tires, Mr. Holmes. After all, covering better than 40 miles at top speed, they have to make two or three changes. Yes, I never heard of having to change a horse's shoes two or three times in 40 miles, did you? Oh, quiet, Watson. <laughs> the day will come, Dr. Watson, when you'll see tires that will go as much as 500 miles without requiring replacement. Don't mind him, Dr. Watson. He has the same illusions as my uncle of the future of these dreadful machines. Yes, there he comes. Oh, there he goes. What color's the car? What, can you See? So much dust, I, I just make a flash of red. The grass is red. It's your uncle. I know you, so it is. We've won, we've won. I told you we'd win. Well, oh, come on. Let's be the first to congratulate Uncle. Well, Holmes, our little job is finished now. I hope so, Watson. I hope so. <laughs> Well, I'll admit the way Mr. Grierson took the bridge outside Alton, my heart was in my mouth. But it was a great race. Hello, everybody. Hello, Charles. Hello, Charles. Where's Mr. Grierson, Charles? Oh, I left him down in the barn. He's crooning over the car like a mother. <laughs> you don't think, Mr. Holmes, that the twisters who've been causing this trouble would try any tricks now that the race is over, do you, sir? I hardly think anyone will make any attempts on the car. Oh, here's a telegram for you, Mr. Holmes. It just arrived. Thank you. Is Uncle Austin still down at the barn? Just passed by there. But I heard a motor running. Uncle's promised to let me drive the next race. I'm glad it's you and not Edward who likes motors. I say, Holmes, where are you going? Down to the barn. You don't think that there's anything wrong, do you? I told you, Watson, I was no longer concerned about the car. Give me a hand with this door, Watson. Seems to be stuck. Here, let me get my shoulder against it. Now. Push. Push. Back, Watson, back. What is it, Holmes? What's wrong? What the earth's the matter? Don't go in there. That motor's still running. Those fumes are deadly carbon monoxide. Oh. Edward, take Helen back to the house. No, no, Holmes, don't. Don't I go in there. I've got that curtain out. Uh, all right, I'll help you. No, you don't, Dr. Watson. If you go in, there'll be three of you in this great right house. Here. Give me your hand. Oh, yeah. That's better. Take care of it, Watson. No use going on with that artificial respiration, Charles. I'm afraid there's nothing further that we can do for your uncle. Will you get in touch with the police, Charles? I'll send someone to town right away. I'd best get down to the factory and tell them what's happened. There'll be no party over the victory tonight. Uh, there's another devilish thing that you can charge up to the motor car homes. Grierson evidently stayed in the closed barn with the motor running. Was overcome by the deadly fumes, fell, and died of suffocation. And how do, how do you account for that deep wound at the back of his head? Well, obviously, when he fell, he struck his head against the metal bonnet of the car. You saw the blood on the edge of the bonnet, didn't you? Quite so. And I also noticed that Grierson's face is extremely pale. Did you notice that, Watson? Yes, of course. What of it? Simply that carbon monoxide victims invariably show a cherry red discoloration of the face. What do you mean, Holmes? This is no accident, Watson. This is murder. <laughs> Mm. 
just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the mysterious death of Austin Grierson. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't just settle for any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Kremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day and always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel leaves your scalp feeling so alive. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kremel help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened after Sherlock Holmes discovered Mr. Gerson had not died accidentally, but had been murdered? Well, I was still the only one to whom Holmes had revealed the shocking discovery, and he'd cautioned me to say nothing of it. As we walked back to the house a few minutes later, I suggested a theory. And on what do you base your suspicions of Edward Watson? Well, it's obvious. Gerson told us last night that his two nephews would inherit equally. And Edward has made no secret of the fact that he felt his uncle was throwing away the family fortune in this wild venture. Besides, he had the opportunity. What do you think, Holmes? I think, Watson, that the libel laws being what they are, and Edward being a lawyer, you had better not air your opinion where he can hear you. Oh, really? Ah, Edward. How is Helen? She's resting upstairs, Mr. Holmes. One of the maids is staying with her. This horrible affair has shaken her badly. Of course. I've sent Joe Simmons to town with a message for the police, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Charles. I'm afraid it'll be the better part of an hour before we can expect them. I wonder, Watson, if you'd be good enough to take care of this little matter that I've noted down on the slip of paper. Huh? Oh, 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 right. Um, I'll see to it at once, Holmes. Gentlemen, I gathered from what your uncle said last night that you will now be the joint owners of the Southampton Machine Works and of his uh, motor car patents. Yes. Do you intend to carry on as before? Of course not, Mr. Holmes. My uncle knew how I felt about all this expensive foolishness. I've agreed to buy out Edward's share, and he's going up to London to carry on his legal career. Well, if you don't need me for anything further, Mr. Holmes, I think I'll sit upstairs and see how Helen is doing. Of course, Edward. I hope you'll find her bearing up under the shock. Mm, thank you. Charles, there are one or two minor points that I'd like to get clear in my own mind before the police arrive. Anything I can tell you, Mr. Holmes, I'll be glad to. Now, Charles, when you left, uh, when uh, we left you and your uncle, he was about to have you check some question regarding the sparking plugs in the motor. Is that right? Quite, Mr. Holmes. I opened the bonnet and removed the sparking plugs for uncle's inspection. Meanwhile, he refilled the petrol tank. So that there would be sufficient petrol to allow him to test the motor, I assume. That's right. The tank was almost empty after the race. Precisely. You uh, didn't help him refill the tank then, did you? No, I was busy removing the sparking plugs. And when you were finished... Uncle told me not to wait for him, that he wanted to run the engine for a few minutes and that I should join you others up here. And you came straight from the barn to the room in which we all were? Why, yes. You stopped nowhere on the way? Nowhere, Mr. Holmes. Well, that all seems simple enough. Yes, I took care of that little matter, Holmes. Is uh, everything satisfactory? Quite, quite. Excellent. If you and Charles will excuse me, Watson, I'll be back in a few minutes. Why, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Uh, by the way, Charles... Dr. Watson and I will be returning to London as soon as the police have been here. Very well. I suppose, Dr. Watson, that this tragic accident confirms your distaste for the motor car. Yes, it does, Charles. Or rather, it would if uh, Holmes hadn't convinced me that it wasn't an accident. What do you mean? Oh, uh, I said something I shouldn't... Uh... I uh, thought Holmes had told you that... Uh, told me what? Uh, uh, nothing. No, nothing, nothing. I insist on knowing what you're hinting. Well, uh, Are you implying that my uncle's death was not accidental? Well, uh, of course it didn't occur to me. But Holmes pointed out that in the case of monoxide poisoning, the face and lips would be congested. And your uncle's face was pale. Holmes seemed to think that I'll he, see for myself what Holmes thinks. I won't stand for any insinuations. That... Holmes seemed to think that your uncle was... Oh, gone. Watson, did he take the bait? <laughs> Swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Good work, Watson. 
You evidently carried out my instructions in the note to perfection. Yes, I think I convinced him that I left the cat out of the bag quite accidentally. He said he was going off to have it out with you at once. He must have changed his mind rather suddenly, judging from the way he hurried down the hall and tiptoed out of the front door. I don't understand. To prove that Austin Grierson was murdered, Watson, would be a matter of utmost simplicity. But my certainty that it was Charles who murdered him rests upon so slender a bit of evidence that I'm sure no jury in the world would convict him. It was necessary to make Charles betray himself, and he fell into our trap. His very flight is a confession of guilt. Ah, listen. So that's why you tell me to remove those things, sparking plugs, you call them, from the car. Quite. So that Charles would be forced to make his escape on one of the horses, once he'd discovered that the car would not start. But Holmes, undoubtedly, he'll take the fastest horse. How on earth are we going to catch up with him? In the motor car, of course. The motor car? But Simmons isn't here. Who on earth is going to drive the infernal thing? I observed Mr. Grierson's actions rather closely yesterday. I feel quite certain that I am competent to operate the machine. Oh, this is the end. Come on, Watson. Show me where you hit those sparking plugs. <laughs> Taking him any moment. And keep your service revolver ready. Hello, there's something up ahead there. Just caught a glimpse of it against the skyline. There he is. Brace yourself, Watson. I'm going to cut in ahead of him. Stop or we fire. Good shot, Watson. You kill me, you devils. Take a look at him, Watson. Cut him through the shoulder. Painful, but not fatal. Blast you, Holmes. You had the devil's own luck. I can assure you it wasn't luck that gave you away and revealed your whole scheme. You thought that once your uncle was out of the way and you had bought out your brother's interest, you would have sole control of a business that would prove a gold mine. You can't prove it. A gold mine? Why, Edward told me that Mr. Grierson had sunk a fortune into his experiments. So he had. But what Edward did not know, but Charles had evidently learned was that the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson had offered Mr. Grierson a hundred thousand pounds for his patents. The offer was dependent upon his winning the race. The telegram I received yesterday from Holder and Stevenson was an answer to uh, my inquiry. You devil! Good heavens and Holmes! All those previous attempts at sabotage... Those were designed to make us think that some competitor was responsible. All meant to point away from the real murderer. The dog. Why poison the dog? Another attempt to lead us off the track by making us believe strangers were responsible. But Holmes, what was it that made you realize that it was Charles who killed his uncle? As I've often told you, Watson, you see, but you do not observe. You may remember that when we returned from our drive, Mr. Austin Grierson, when you wanted to wash off the dust, told you that there was no place in the barn where you could do so. What on earth has that got to do with it? When this fellow here had removed the sparking plugs after the race at his uncle's request, his hands must have been covered with dirt and grease. But when he joined us at the house, his hands were quite clean. He told me when I questioned him that he had not stopped anywhere on the way. Obviously, it must have been he that filled the petrol tank so that the engine would keep running after he had killed his uncle. Nothing but petrol would have washed off the oil and dirt from his hands. Good heavens, Holmes, and that was the slender clue which told you that he'd killed Grierson. So slender a clue, Watson, that it was only your excellent performance that betrayed this fellow into the flight that will convict him. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> you only did what you told me, Holmes. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Ladies, of course you use a shampoo to wash your hair. But just a word of caution. There are many popular shampoos today which leave the hair lustrous but have a tendency to dry the hair. And here's why I advise you to always use Cremel. Lovely Powers models were among the first to discover the amazing beautifying qualities of Cremel shampoo. Yes, Mr. Bell. The girls claim no other shampoo leaves hair with more brilliant, glossy, natural highlights. Yet, under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry your hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. It really is different, Mr. Bell. After a Cremel shampoo, the hair actually radiates natural, brilliant luster. But Cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with Cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. K-R-E-M-L, 
Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you a story I always referred to as Q for murder. Q for murder? That sounds as if it concerned the theater, Dr. Watson. That's why you're wrong, Mr. Bell. Oh? This adventure took place in the depth of Limehouse near the docks and concerned a particularly unpleasant and fiendish murderer. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Barrow Coronet. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.